All right. So thank you to Dr. Mithasami and Dr. Zvelian for inviting me to speak today. I know there's a lot of love on the stage today, but uh, you know, to me, looking at this panel here, these are basically all my mentors. I trained in, at Penn for residency where uh, Mike Coachman was my GI mentor, and then I came to UCLA where, where I worked with Raman, Ali, and Tim. So it's good to be up here. It's a great honor for me to be here with my mentors on stage giving you guys a talk today. So my topic today is the, the evolving role of EUS in pancreatic disease. My disclosures are Boston Scientific and Aries. I am gonna talk about a bunch of new technologies, devices, none of which I have any ties to. So I think anytime I give a talk on endoscopic ultrasound, I basically have to describe what it is, and I know many guys are, are GI physicians or in the GI field, um, but endoscopic ultrasound, to many people who don't do it, is kind of a black box. You just send the patients for a referral for an EUS and things happen. Um, but I just wanna give some basics around EUS before discussing kind of the uh, newer technologies around this, this, uh, this device or this procedure. So introduced commercially in the 1980s, it combines endoscopy with ultrasound capabilities, and it's used in the examination of the upper GI tract, the pancreas and bile ducts, and the rectum. And the endoscopic ultrasound device comes in two types. There's the radial scope and the linear scope. The radial scope scans in a plane perpendicular to the axis of the scope, so it's more like a CAT scan, right? It gives cross-sectional imaging. The linear scans in a plane parallel to the axis of the scope, so it's more like you take the scope, you can think of it like a finger, it scans down in one direction. So in order to get a cross-sectional view, you've got to scan with the scope left and right to get a view of what's going on. Right? And this is very important because of the functions of these two scopes. So with the radial, end of the scope, ra radial echo endoscope, you're basically getting cross-sectional imaging. So this is typically used for staging of luminal cancers. So you can imagine this scope would be useful in looking at a cross-section of an esophageal mass, a gastric lesion, a rectal lesion, subepithelial lesions. It can also be used to obviously look at um, the pancreas and the bile duct, but it's mostly a, it's purely a diagnostic tool in the sense that you get imaging without capability of doing any additional uh, therapeutic work. This is in contrast to the linear echo in the scope, where again, it scans in one plane, but you can pass instruments through the linear echo in the scope, such as a needle, to essentially biopsy or um, perform a celiac plexus, neurolysis, uh, perform um, endoscopic drainage of pseudocyst transgastrically or transduodenal. Um, this is all done through the linear echo endoscope, right? And so again, just the indications for endoscopic ultrasound, you know, mostly diagnostic when it first came out, staging of cancers such as esophageal, stomach, rectal, and pancreas cancers, uh, evaluation of subepithelial lesions, and then it can be used in the tissue acquisition of masses and tumors, for example, pancreas masses, uh, lymph nodes, and cysts, again, such as pancreatic cysts, which we'll get into because talk is EUS around pancreatic diseases. In terms of therapeutic interventions, you can do C-like plexus blocks or the drainage of pancreatic pseudocysts. And I personally left kind of this larger blank here because I think the role of therapeutic interventions with EUS is growing. So I thought, to discuss kind of the newer therapies or the evolving role of EUS, I'd do this in a case-based manner. So we'll discuss one case at a time and try to demonstrate maybe where a new role or new, um, new technique or device may be used uh, in the evaluation of pancreatic diseases. All right, so here's our first case. 59-year-old woman undergoes a CT scan for left upper quadrant pain. And the CT scan incidentally finds a 2.3 centimeter cyst in the uncinate of the pancreas, right? Very common story, patients get scanned you find an incidental cyst in the pancreas, and they reported no high-risk features seen on the CT scan. So before I go on, ask the audience, what would you do next? Right? It's a very common scenario, CT scan, incidental finding of a 2.3 centimeter cyst with no high-risk features, what would you do? So A is nothing, B is get a CT scan in one year for surveillance, C is get an MRI pelvis now, next one get an MRI in a year, an EUS now or an EUS in one year. All right, so most people get an EUS now. All right, interesting. I know I'm giving a talk on EUS. Uh, if you look at the AGA guidelines for an asymptomatic cyst with no other high-risk features, right? This doesn't meet criteria in the sense it's not greater than three centimeters, no main pancreatic duct dilation, no mural nodule seen within the cyst. The recommendation would be to get imaging in a year. Um, so interesting, you guys all picked the EUS. So this patient ends up getting an MRI. Complex cystic lesion in the uncinate process of the pancreas. 
roughly the same size as seen on the CT scan, no main pancreatic duct dilation, no enhancement of the cyst after gadolinium. The patient gets yearly MRI for the next four years. So four years after this initial CT scan, the most recent MRI shows mild interval increase. It's basically gone from 2.3 centimeters to 2.5 centimeters in five years or four years. And again, no other high-risk features. So the patient is then referred for an endoscopic ultrasound. So here's what we found on the ultrasound. There's a 24 by 18 millimeter cyst in the uncinate process, and there's some micro and macrocystic components. All right, so you can appreciate if this mouse shows up here, but up in this cyst here, you see some microcystic components, maybe what you describe as kind of honeycombing appearance. Then there are some macrocystic components, meaning there are some larger cystic components within the cyst. And so for most of us, when we see cysts in the pancreas, this is our typical differential. Is it a mucinous cystic neoplasm, an IPMN, a serous adenoma, a pancreatic pseudocyst, or a cystic degeneration of our neuroendocrine tumor? And I think for most of us who do EUS, we take a look at this thing and we quickly cross off a bunch of these things because it just doesn't fit, right? Either epidemiologically, the patient's history, story, and the most likely scenario is it's either an IPMN or it's a serous cyst adenoma, right? IPMNs being the most common cysts we see throughout the pancreas, the patient's features, including the fact there's no main duct dilation, may suggest that it's a branch duct IPMN. The fact that there are some microcystic components, so this honeycomb appearance, uh, may suggest that it's more of a serous cyst adenoma. All right? And I think the, difference, the main difference here is that a serous cyst adenoma is benign. You don't typically need to follow these things. You could stop surveillance now. All those four years of MRIs are probably a waste of money. Um, whereas if it's a branch duct IPMN, you may, you can make the argument here with the AJA guidelines, we don't need to follow this patient any further because there's been very little growth over four years, but it is a mucinous precancerous lesion that you could argue maybe you need to follow this thing in the future, right? So if you can make a definitive diagnosis here about what type of cyst it is, then you could potentially either continue surveying or stop surveillance altogether and tell the patient, this is nothing for you to worry about, okay? So nowadays, you do, you do an EOS, you can FNA this thing, and you may not, or there's a good chance you're not gonna get a definitive diagnosis as to what type of cyst this is, and you're gonna be kind of left with, look, it could be one or the other. The safe thing to do would be to call it a branch of the IPMN, follow you with surveillance, um, if you think it's, if it's concerning at all, okay? So is there a way to make this diagnosis? So here's a new technology. It's called confocal laser endomicroscopy, or CLE for short. And essentially, it's an optical biopsy. It's taking real-time pathology while you're in the procedure. It's like taking a, a looking at the pathology uh, in real time. And I don't know how the technology works exactly, uh, that's beyond me, but essentially um, it allows you to see at the cellular level. And so this has been well described in terms of looking at pancreatic cysts. So they even actually pass the probe through the needle into the cyst and you can take a look at the pathology. So if this is the you know, final path surgical pathology specimen in a resected IPMN, this is what you would see on this technology, right? And you can see this papillary projection surrounded by the epithelial border. This would be analogous to this finding on PATH. Similarly, in a serous adenoma, uh, there's this thing that they describe as a superficial vascular network. And this is these little vessels here with, uh, with blood running through them, and that corresponds to these pathologic finding here. Again, for mucinocystic neoplasms, you see a cis wall with a mucinous epithelial border. And then a pancreas pseudocyst, it basically looks just like a bunch of inflammatory cells, right? But the idea is that you can actually get real-time path in a procedure to make the diagnosis. So during this EOS, a 19-gauge needle was passed into the uncinate cyst, and the needle-based CLE probe was passed through the FNA needle into the cyst here, all right? And here are some of the imagings that, imaging that we got. And this would be the superficial vascular network associated with a serous cyst adenoma. And so when you play the video, understand that this thing is looking at the micron level. So if you're, even if you think you're not moving at all, or the patient's not, the patient was moving, you're not moving the needle, it still moves pretty crazy on the screen because you're on the, on the level of micrometers. But you can start to see here this superficial vascular network. You can see red blood cells running through this network along the cyst wall, which is kind of pretty cool, right? And so, um, They've described the superficial vascular network as being very specific 
for serous adenomas and essentially make the diagnosis of a serous adenoma based on this finding alone, right? Because it essentially corresponds with the final pathology you would see if it was surgically resected and looked at under a microscope. So when they've looked at um, how good is this CLE probe or CLE device in differentiating cysts, they had six endosonographers look at patients who had, these are these were ex vivo, so after they've been resected, so these are not in vivo, but 29 pancreas, six, 16 of which were mucinous, 13 of which were non-mucinous, um, and they found that the sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy of being able to make a diagnosis was pretty high. It's even higher for serous adenomas because of this essentially pathonomic finding you can see with the CLE device. Okay? All right, so we're going to move on to case two. So 54-year-old man, incidental finding of a cyst in the tail of the pancreas, very similar story. He has a remote history of one episode of acute pancreatitis from alcohol use. He denies any alcohol use for the past 20 years. And an MRI, MRCP, is ordered to further follow this pancreas cyst. So again, I'll ask the audience, if you had to guess, what type of cyst does the patient have? So A is cyst, serous adenoma, B an IPMN, C is pseudocyst, or D mucocystic neoplasm. And all right, so most people said pancreatic pseudocyst, right? Because this idea that the patient had pancreatitis a long time ago, maybe it's been sitting around there for a long time. You see it on imaging; it's been there. Who cares? It's in, it's uh, incidental, and the patient's asymptomatic. I think it's a very reasonable guess. And IPMN being the you know most common cyst seen in the pancreas. Uh, makes sense for a second best answer. And then uh, I agree that serous adenoma and mucinous neoplasm would be lower on the differential, particularly because they're most often seen in women as well. All right, so pancreas classification, I know this is mostly reviewed at this point, but pseudocysts have no epithelial lining. If you have a cyst with an epithelial lining, you have serous cysts and mucinous cysts. Serous would be a serous adenoma. If it's mucinous, you can get either MCNs or IPMNs. And then when the IPMNs are further differentiated into main duct and branch duct. So on the MRI, it shows this cyst here in the tail of the pancreas. Here's the main pancreatic duct running across the body and tail of the pancreas. You see it sitting right there. And it describes a 2.5 centimeter cyst in the tail of the pancreas with mural enhancement of the walls. And I, I recognize that this MRCP doesn't really show this mural enhancement very well. Um, but the patient then underwent an EUS. So on the EOS, it's a 2.6 by 2.4 centimeter cyst in the tail of the pancreas. And I think you can appreciate that this cyst has a very thick wall around it, this thick rind around the cyst. And that's not typically what we see with most pancreatic cysts. And so an FNA was performed. Um, so when I was seeing this patient, the question was, what, what kind of cyst is this? I've never seen a cyst that looked like this with this really thick wall. Is there anything else I can do to make uh, a better diagnosis of what this cyst would be, right? Because that would determine what his prognosis and what to do about this cyst. So I decided to use something called the Moray Micro Forceps. It's forceps that can be passed through an FNA needle during the endoscopic ultrasound. These are very small forceps and allows tissue sampling from the pancreas cyst wall, right? So I think it's kind of interesting. You can actually biopsy the cyst wall and it fits through most 19 gauge FNA needles. And again, much similar to kind of CLE, they've done uh, the diagnostic yield of this device. You know, how good is it differentiating mucinous versus non-mucinous versus malignancy? And they compared it to just FNA alone. And they looked at pancreas cyst fluid. They're using markers like amylase, CEA, um, DNA testing to see can they make a differentiation of whether or not it's a mucinous or non-mucinous cyst. And they found that the diagnostic yields were pretty similar. And this was not statistically significant. But when they looked at, you know, how good is each modality in, in identifying specifically what the type of cyst it is, so making a true diagnosis. They found that with pancreas cyst fluid, you can make a diagnosis about 17% of the time. And with the Moray forceps, they're making a diagnosis 52 or 53% of the time, right? Meaning they're getting pathologic diagnosis using forceps when they biopsy the cyst wall. And this was statistically significant. All right, so I passed, this is a picture from the same EOS, I passed the forceps through uh, into the cyst and took biopsies of the thickened cyst wall. This next video is not from this patient, but I want to demonstrate 
the forceps in a video form. So here is the needle going into the cyst. And then you'll see this tiny forceps coming out through, this, through the needle. It's abutting the wall on the opposite end of the cyst. And we're trying to take a biopsy there. And that first one, you didn't really see much of a tug. And so we're going to try again here. And again, the forceps open. You see it close in the cyst wall. And then you can see it kind of tenting the wall of the cyst. And that's how you know you got a piece. These are very, very, very small, tiny specimens. Look like fish food when you get them out and put them into the, uh, into the formalin. And again, just another pass there with the, uh, with the forceps. So what did the FNA show? So 5cc is a clear, slightly pink fluid. It was aspirated to cis fluid MLA 74 CEA 1.6 cytology postisellar. This is like, seems like most of my FNAs, right? Like, what do I do with this? Like, I don't, I don't, it's a cyst, great, follow, get another MI in a year, get another US in a year, you know, it's not very useful. But what did my biopsy forceps show? So biopsy of the cyst wall showed clusters of monotonous cells with round nuclei and smooth contours, which mean that he turned positive for chromogranin, and so the final pathology was a neuroendocrine tumor. It was a cystic degeneration of a neuroendocrine tumor that was in the tail of the pancreas. So this patient was actually referred to Tim Donahue, who did his pancreas surgery. He underwent successful distal, distal pancreatectomy and splenectomy, and final pathology on the surgical specimen, a grade one neuroendocrine tumor, All right? So just another modality we have of making a diagnosis in patients with pancreatic cysts that we probably couldn't do even a few years ago, okay? All right, and we'll do case number three. 74-year-old woman feels lightheaded and dizzy every morning for the past few months. She becomes diaphoretic and thirsty and also occurs after physical activity and symptoms improve after eating a muffin, bread, or juice. This poor woman's thinking about what she's got. So here are fasting labs for insulin's elevated, C-peptides elevated, and her glucose is very low. And she's lightheaded and dizzy at the time. She gets better with orange juice. Essentially, she's diagnosed with an insulinoma. So she gets the workup done looking for where this insulinoma is located. CT scan, MRI, octreotide, all of which are negative. Not surprising, they're often hard to find. And she's referred for an endoscopic ultrasound. So on the EUS, she's got a tiny nine by seven millimeter round hypochoic lesion in the pancreas tail. And here it is, this is zoomed in a lot. So you can imagine it's less than a centimeter in size. And an FNA is performed. And the cytology is consistent with a neuroendocrine tumor. So you found her insulinoma. She's referred to surgery, but she's considered to be a poor surgical candidate. She's 74 years old and has a lot of medical issues. So she continues to be symptomatic from the insulinoma. So there's anything else we can do for her. So this new device has come out is an EOS RFA needle, right? So you can actually pass this needle, again, through the FNA needle. And during endoscopic ultrasound, you put the tip into the actual mass lesion, and you can ablate the neuroendocrine tumor. And this causes tissue necrosis, much like it does, RFA does in other parts of the body. And so here's a demonstration from a paper that was published in GIE, where you can see the, the, the RFA needle pass through, the RFA catheter is passed through the needle. It's now sitting in the lesion. And you can start to see bubbling. It's kind of dark up there, but you can see some bubbling on the screen. And that's where the ablation is taking place. You can make me appreciate it there a little bit more. And you're basically ablating the tumor. And there you go, you see it bubbling again. So there's very limited data published to date on this technology. There are case reports and case series of this RFA device being used to treat insulinomas, mucous pancreas cysts, uh, celiac ganglion for pain, uh, lymph nodes, and pancreatic adenocarcinoma, all right? And I saw on a committed ASGE for DDW, there's you know, several abstracts using this technology to treat neuroendocrine tumors and potentially even adenocarcinoma, I'm not exactly sure why. Yes, they proved that it gets smaller, but is that really helping the patient? I'm not entirely sure. But this device is out there now, and uh, it may make more headway in the, in the future, all right? So following US RFA of the insulinoma, the patient's hypoglycemia resolves within 24 hours. She remains euglycemic and asymptomatic at one year following ablation. Look how happy she looks on the screen. All right, so in terms of indications for EUS, just again, talk about therapeutic indications, celiac plexus neurolysis, drainage of pancreatic pseudocysts, you know, ablation of tumors and cysts may be coming. Um, we use 
EOS for bowel and pancreatic duct access when needed. Uh, it may be in the, in the coming years being used for drug delivery. There's certain, cer certainly a lot of work being done here, uh, particularly in, in animal models of delivering drugs through the portal vein, less systemic toxicity, higher concentrations in the liver, uh, and potentially portal, potentially portal being a sampling of circulating tumor cells, particularly in pancreatic cancer, where we may be able, able to, uh, maybe not so much therapeutic, but putting a needle into the portal vein again, collecting blood that may help you figure out the patient's got metastatic disease and whether or not they should continue with treatment or not. So just in conclusion, EUS plays an essential role in the management of pancreatic disease. New devices are improving our diagnostic yield of pancreatic cysts and tumors. EUS RFA is potential treatment for pancreas lesions in patients who are poor surgical candidates. And a the therapeutic role in EUS in pancreatic disease is only just beginning. Thank you. <laughs>